All right, next up we have Sean Himmel giving a talk called Tips for Making, Marketing, and Selling Your Hardware with Free and Open Source Tools. Sean is a marketing advisor and technical content creator, formerly the SparkFun Bowtie Guy. He helps companies engage with audiences through videos, tutorials, blog posts. In his free time, he can be spotted fiddling with register bits, avoiding soldering burns, and te tearing up the dance floor. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you, Drew. I was putting together this talk, and my first thought was not just, hey, KeyCAD is great. What other software tools exist out there to help people make and manufacture their hardware components, whatever they're trying to make? I noticed that there's a lot of people here who are much more knowledgeable about manufacturing than I am, so I decided to focus more on the selling and marketing side. Um, so. With that, there's a lot of stuff to cover here. I will briefly go over the making and manufacturing part. I think a lot of people here are pretty familiar with some of the making tools that are available. There's a lot of people here who are giving talks on the manufacturing side. I recommend going to see them. I know the SparkFun side. That is a very niche way to manufacture something, so I can help answer questions for that. But there are other turnkey manufacturers out there that can help you. But with that, I want to talk mostly about what it takes to sell it, what it takes to sell your widget, and what it takes to market it. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time on marketing because I think that's a lot of dark art for a lot of people. It's an art in the sense that it's kind of taught in business and marketing schools and definitely not in engineering. And it's something I've been picking up and learning um, at, during my time at SparkFun as well as doing freelance. So the design side. I know a lot of people here are probably familiar with many of these tools. KeyCAD, hooray, is this mic? Okay, hooray, KeyCAD. There's FreeCAD, which we had the workshop for earlier for doing mechanical. Fusion's kind of free, definitely not open source. There's a lot of microcontroller tools if you're not familiar with them. AVRGCC, GCC for almost everything. There's the GNU ARM embedded tool chain. And then there's the IDEs. There's Eclipse, Atom, VS Code are kind of the three main uh, popular ones that I've seen, and a variety of plugins that are available for them. I learned some Eclipse plugins, like System Workbench for STM32. It works pretty well. I'm iffy on Eclipse in general, but it's gotten better over the years. Atom and VS Code are very nice, and there's this thing called Platform IO, which is open source and free with the exception of the step through debugging thing, as far as I know, which is kind of weird to me. But it's out there. There's more tools coming up to help you do microcontroller stuff. I saw something that was a plugin for an FPGA tool, and that's about as far as my knowledge goes for FPGA work. But more and more tools are becoming available to help you do design work. What about manufacturing? Well, you can move to Shenzhen. That's absolutely fine. You can make contacts there. Uh, you can do your research to find what's in China to help you manufacture. That side, there's a lot of people here who are more knowledgeable about that. There was a panel earlier that talked about the manufacturing side. You can also pitch to SparkFun and Adafruit. As somebody who worked for SparkFun, I will tell you that your chances of getting SparkFun and Adafruit to manufacture your thing is like 0.1%. It's very, very narrow. I had several, many, many people over the years approach me and say, you work for SparkFun, can you make my thing? And I would have to be honest and I can say, I will bring this back, I will bring it to the powers that be, I will put it in our, in our pipeline of things that we're looking for, and they, you might have to wait about six months to get an answer. And then even then, you might have to wait another six months before they decide to manufacture it if they said yes in the first place. So getting one of those two specialized manufacturing companies to make your device is pretty slim. I will tell you that up front. That's not to say it's not worth trying because that can be an easy way, especially if you can communicate to, the, to them the fact that your part fits in with what they're trying to make their catalog and how it helps them. There are many small, key turn, there's many small turnkey manufacturers in the US that are available for you. Uh, Seed Studio Propagate is in China, but you can throw them some money. Last I heard, you have to use their library, so I don't know really how that works. I've had some luck with Screaming Circuits. They can be pricey. When I was pricing some things out, what I found was that you want a minimum order of about 1,000 seems to be a good price point. They'll do 10, but you're going to pay about 100 per unit for 10. And at 1,000, you start to get something that you can sell and make money on that doesn't look ridiculous. Um, then there's some other places like Small Batch Assembly in Northern Virginia. I think that's a one or two person shop um, and they will happily make stuff for you. So keep those in mind when you're manufacturing. Let's talk about selling. Selling these days is relatively easy. There's so much e-commerce out there 
that setting up a site, setting up some kind of marketplace is pretty straightforward. Once again, you can pitch SparkFun and Adafruit. As somebody who worked for SparkFun, I will tell you it's a lot easier to get to SparkFun and tell them, hey, I've manufactured this device, will you resell it? At least for SparkFun, they were more open to reselling devices because they don't have to tie up their assembly line with your thing. And they have their own priorities when it comes to manufacturing their own devices, both for royalties, trying to make profits, as well as if you did it in KiCad, they're still using Eagle. And in order for them to maintain that, it becomes a pain. So I kind of get why they don't want to manufacture it. But if you pitch a device that's already been made, they're more likely to list it on their marketplace and house it. That's the big thing, is getting warehouse space. There's other marketplaces available. Tindy, Amazon are good marketplaces to list your device. Keep in mind that a lot of these, you have to warehouse it yourself. If somebody orders something, you have to ship it. Amazon, you can warehouse in Amazon, but there are, I can't remember the specifics, but if you're not moving a certain amount of your inventory out of their warehouse every week, every month, they will charge you. So keep that in mind when you're getting started. You may want to warehouse it yourself and ship it as people buy it if you're just getting started with a new business or a single device. There's also sites like GroupGets. This kind of works as a Kickstarter where you can list your device and you can get people to commit to it, um, back it, and they may ship it to SparkFun, they may put it up on Tindy, whatever it is, but it's a kind of a Kickstarter way to get your device going without running a full Kickstarter campaign. If you're interested in hosting your own site, there are plenty of frameworks available. WordPress is a good one. WordPress is free and open source. So is WooCommerce. That's a plugin for WordPress. Those two things together, you can combine to make an e-commerce site for, I'm not going to say free, because buying a domain name and not hosting a, a server in your own house still costs money. But at least that framework is free for e-commerce. Let's get into the fun part, the marketing side. This is the dark art that a lot of people go, ooh, marketing, that's like manipulating people's minds to buy what you want. And I'm telling you right now, it's not that bad. You're probably used to what they call outbound marketing, and that is where you pay somebody for airspace, for a printed ad, for a banner on a website, and then you put your thing that says, buy this thing now, and somebody clicks on it, goes and buys it. That's a traditional method known as outbound marketing. That still kind of works. There's nothing wrong with that, but it does cost a good bit of money. There's also the inbound marketing side. And this is a relatively new thing. It's especially being pushed by HubSpot because they want you to use their tool, obviously. And the idea here is you create blogs, videos, podcasts, social media, any kind of content. You create content for free so that people can get value out of it. For me, it's tutorials. I like to make things that teach people something. I consider education to be one of the most important marketing techniques. You build a brand over time and people will eventually come to know you be loyal and hopefully buy your stuff. Now that might be a service, in my case that's a service, or in the case of say SparkFun, that might be buying their products. So if you haven't seen this marketing funnel before, the idea here is that you take the entire world of people and you create content for a small audience in that, relatively small, right? It could be people wanting to know what V equals IR is, but still a relatively small subset of people in the world. So they, you write an article, you create a podcast, maybe the Amp Hour, and you get a group of people to come in and engage, listen to, read your article. That's the first part. You've attracted an audience. And this is a subset of the people in the world. From there, you want them to engage with that content. You want them to like it. You want them to share it, comment on it. Hopefully do something like subscribe to your newsletter or follow you on Instagram, whatever it might be. You want them to engage with, with you. Once you build up this group of followers, oh, and by the way, these people who engage, these are gonna be a subset of the people you've attracted. And hence why this funnel gets, the funnel gets smaller and smaller as you narrow down the group of people inside of this funnel. Once they've engaged, you can then close. You can say, hey, you've been following us for a while. We think you might like this product. There's nothing wrong with directly asking. And that's closing to get them to buy something. That's the marketing cycle. And from there, you want them to turn into advocates. Ideally, if you give, a, to give them a good enough experience with your product, with your service, they will tell their friends and nothing beats word of mouth. So let's break these down. What, what are some tools that are available and how can we create our own funnel? The first stage is attracting. Like I said, create something free for your audience. The most important thing you can do is identify who you're going for. If you are creating, I don't know, the next free open source version of the Fitbit, 
you want to wear it on your watch, and you start writing about crayons, you've probably misidentified your audience. Write something about health and fitness and wearables. That's helping to target your audience. Find where they are. This is the next and most, most important thing. I was at SparkFun, and towards my, my last year there, I helped run this survey. We wanted to find out where the people who were buying SparkFun tools, buying SparkFun parts, where they hung out. Because everything we had been reading in all of the marketing journals that were out there had said, you need to be on social media. So we were on social media, because that's what all the marketing literature said. So we're putting a lot of effort into looking at analytics, making sure we're on Twitter, making sure we're on Instagram, tweeting every day, trying to do live events. So we run this survey. I, I had this question, I was like, are the people really there? We have this assumption because marketing literature tells us they're there, but we're assuming that our audience, the engineers, the tinkerers, the, hobbyers, the hobbyists, the makers, they're on Twitter, they're on Instagram. So we question that assumption. We run this survey, and I think we get about 10,000 respondents back. So take this with a grain of salt. We're assuming that 10,000 people is representative of the people who buy from SparkFun, and that's not necessarily the case. But we have to make that assumption to go, okay, it might be representative in some form or fashion. So we find that about 80, 70 to 80% of those people did not care about social media. They weren't on Twitter, they weren't on Instagram, so we went, why are we spending all this time putting effort into social media? We need to find where they hang out. Guess what, they still used Google and email. They loved hearing from SparkFun over email. At least that's what we determined. So we started running a new campaign, and in that I decided uh, we wanted to sell more Raspberry Pi or single board computer stuff. So I started writing these articles that were how to use Python, how to use Matplotlib, how do you get scripts to run on boot up, fairly straightforward beginner, maybe approaching intermediate level, and we started showing up on Google, first page results, over and over again with some of these articles. Not super difficult to do if you title it right, if you write the right content. So with that, in the bottom of that we said, hey, uh, if you wanna hear more from us, give us your email, and we started growing this list. So that's how we started engaging with people. We're finding the right audience, and we're going to where they are, not letting them, not trying to just be on social because somebody says we need to be on social. Some ideas for what you can create content-wise, how to something, insert your tutorial, how to whatever. That is by far my favorite way. I think education is the best form of marketing. You can also cover current news and events. You can also do projects like Hackster or Instructables, they do project sharing and have users commit to these sites um, their own projects. And that's another good way to do it. Provide inspiration, something free for users to engage with. Some good tools for people, google.com slash trends and Neil Patel's Uber Suggest are my two favorite tools when you're trying to figure out what to title your article or piece of content or video. Don't get cute with your titles. You want people to find it. If you make three people laugh and those three people are the only ones who read it, I, I mean, that's funny, right? That's good for, for them. I hope they enjoy it. But you're missing out on potentially hundreds or thousands of people who might gain something out of your article because they couldn't find it for, through whatever search engine. WordPress, another good one if you want to create a blog. I'm sure there's lots of free tools out there for creating your own blog site. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we know those. If you want to create a podcast, be, excuse me, be, Podbean, Buzzsprout, and Anchor are free tools for hosting your own podcast. Um, you can also host it on your own site. YouTube, Vimeo, we know those. So those are available platforms for you. Once you get to that engagement stage, you want them to like, follow, comment, ask questions. You want them to give you something. You want to be a back and forth. Live events, I find, are not good for getting new followers. They are good for engaging your current followers. Uh, the other thing you want to do is with these followers, you want to give them new content something that might be useful to them. Adafruit does a particularly good job of sending out a daily newsletter with interesting tidbits, cool articles to check out. I enjoy seeing Adafruit's uh, little, little newsletter every day. Here's a little tidbit to remember about Zener diodes. That's a good engagement. You have a newsletter following, you send them a little piece every day, or every week, or every month. Whatever seems not spammy, but people seem to like it. it that's gonna take some experimentation. How do you close? This is actually the 
fun and simple part. It's pretty easy. Hopefully at this point, you've identified an audience and you've narrowed it down to just the people you think are interested in what you have to offer as a brand, as a person, or as a company. And you go, hey, you've been following our stuff. Maybe you like this tool. That's it. It's a direct ask. It's pretty straightforward to do. You don't have to trick anybody. You're saying, I can still provide you value. You are asking for money in return, but that's a direct close. Nothing wrong with asking a couple times across a few different platforms, which is whatever feels right. Try not to get spammy. Think about how much you want to hear about a product in your own email list, and then do that. <laughs> Some other good analysis tools, Google Analytics, you can watch how people click through the device, th click through your links, and if they decide to buy something or not. Once you've closed, once you've sold something to somebody, whether it's a product, a service, back me on Kickstarter, you want to turn those customers into advocates. And yes, a few customers, only a few customers will become your advocates, but you want those. You want to nurture those because those are the people who will go out and sell for you. Nothing beats that. To do this, offer great customer support. Fix bugs. Build in operations and maintenance into your life cycle. Some tools available. I think most people here are familiar with GitHub. There's Mantis Bug, Bug Tracker, Bugzilla, and even social media. If you're on social media, say, tweet at us if you run into a problem. It's not a great ticketing tool, but at least it offers a way for customers to give you feedback and listen to it. If they offer negative feedback, take it as learning. That's perfect. Send a follow-up email. They buy it, say, hey, thanks for buying. By the way, if you run into problems, go check out this forum or go check out this bug tracking software. And if you want to host your own forums, that's another good way to building your own community. Maybe have a Discord channel. That's another good way to, for people to hang out and talk about whatever it is they just bought from you. So some lessons that I've learned from this, always be testing. This idea of design something, test it, measure, tweak, create this idea of a funnel. We think people are on Instagram, so we're going to start doing this, and we're going to measure the number of people that come in, look at it, and follow us. And if that doesn't work, and by the way, this might be two, three, four months. This isn't like a weekend project. Once they do that, maybe that works. Learn from it. If that doesn't, okay, they're not on this platform. Jump to a new platform. Come up with an idea, create a hypothesis for what this funnel looks like, and test it. It's more scientific than a lot of marketers want to give credit to it. Some tools available. Google Analytics is your friend. Google Analytics is tough to use, but once you kind of navigate through it, you can find what you're looking for. Ma Somebody, somebody's back there has used it before. There's MailChimp. MailChimp is also good. It's free-ish, but it will give you up to, I think, 2,000 or 20,000 followers, and they will give you analytics for who's clicking through your emails. Serpascope is something useful that I've used. That's a free and open source tool that will show you where you rank on Google. Um, have patience with this. This isn't something that you, like I said, you don't make it over a weekend. The old adage in marketing is it takes 10 years to build a brand, and that's kind of true for people to start recognizing who you are. And there's nothing wrong with starting to market the day you start writing code. You might be a year out from delivering a product. That is when you start marketing. You don't have to tell them what you're selling yet, but start building this audience, because those are the people you want to eventually sell your device to or sell your service to. Uh, Eddie Cantor also said it takes 20 years to make an overnight success. It looks like somebody has just made it, and then you look back at their history, and they've spent a long time developing skills to make this happen. Uh, if you're going to make media, um, these are, here's are some of the tools that I like to use. GIMP is probably my favorite tool. Uh, it is just as powerful as Photoshop, give or take. This is an example of a product photo that I made in about five minutes using GIMP. I took two desk lamps, shown them at 45 degrees over my product, put it on a white piece of paper, took it, threw it in GIMP, chopped out the background, and I've got something that is about 80% as good as some of the other product photos out there. Good enough for Tindy. Can I do better with a DSLR in a light box? Yes, but for five minutes, that's not too bad. For vector graphics, Inkscape is usable. <laughs> there is. I'm not going to hate on Inkscape because it is really the only vector graphics software out there that you can make SVGs with. So uh, it's good for like laser cutting stuff and yeah. There's Audacity, which is one of the most intuitive pieces of software I have ever used, which is great for free and open source. Audacity is wonderful. I will say, do yourself a favor and buy a better microphone. $20 to a lav mic is the best money you will ever spend. Um, if you're trying to do podcasts or if you're trying to do video, um, People never complain about the video quality on even a 
crappy quality video that I make on YouTube. The second there's bad audio, they let me know. The comments will definitely let me know that the audio is bad. So get a better mic. It's way better than your laptop, and it's way better than your phone. For screen rec recording, I've had some success with ShareX. That's free and open source. Um, and then Blender. If you didn't know, Blender has a full video editing suite. It is definitely not intuitive, but it will get the job done. Um, to do overlay graphics, you basically have to make them in GIMP, is what I have found, and then overlay them. It's not a pretty process, but you can do full video editing in Blender. So I think we have about five minutes. With that, I open it up to any questions about this. If not, please follow me, ask me, come find me after. Oh, do you need a mic? So I'm curious uh, if you do get Adafruit or SparkFun or a distributor like that to agree to uh, sell, not manufacture, but sell the product that you're getting manufactured somewhere else. Does that necessarily become an exclusive relationship? Can you continue to sell and market it on your own? Or are you now stuck with them as an exclusive distributor? That is completely negotiable. They may offer you a better royalty if you decide to go exclusive with them. Um, I can say that they prefer exclusivity. But that's always negotiable. You can say, well, I need to sell it with blah, blah, blah. And they say, well, we can only give you, you know, X percent instead of Y percentage. And then you have to decide if that's worthwhile for you. But I've seen both cases. Anybody else? You did touch on it a little bit. But you said, you know, start marketing right when you start coding. Can you, can you give a little bit of an example of that? Like, beyond just the newsletter thing, like, what do you, what do you really mean? Like, if I'm gonna sit down and, and uh, come up with uh, a piece of software that does something, I don't know, uh, pretty so, vague, so that, a piece of software that does something, um, or a simple circuit board or, or something like that, how do, how do I start marketing that? Um, do, I, you know, do I start thinking about the concepts of, that might go into it, like a Zener diode or something like that, and then start making that newsletter or, you know, like, how do, how do you first start catching, how do you find the fish, not just catch them, but, like, how do you start doing that process? The most important thing is to figure out who you're eventually going to make your software to, right? Like, like, if you can give me an example of, I don't know, I'm going to make a free and open source layout tool. Let's use that as an example. So you might start being on, I don't know, where's a good place to hang out for developers? GitHub, right? and start answering people's questions or maybe fixing bugs in other places. And that may seem silly, but that's part of the marketing ploy as far as what you're trying to do. From there, you can also write articles. And that is to maybe start talking about, you don't want to bash other PCB layout tools, but you may want to start talking about layout tricks. Just start a blog that's layout techniques. That has nothing to do with the software itself, but you start attracting people who might use it. So they start reading your blog, and you put on there somewhere, hey, subscribe. And that's how you start catching them. Does that kind of help? Yeah, yeah. I, um, so like, it takes time to code. It takes time to make things. But then you also have to put that time in to the marketing end. And that's, that's writing those articles and, yeah. and doing that work as well, right? I mean, that's. Oh, it's, it's work. There's yeah. no. <laughs> I'm not trying to say that like, this is like magically happened. I mean, if it, if it requires hiring somebody to do this, um, I've heard some statistics of startups using like 40, 50, 60% of their budget just for marketing. Um, if anybody remembers Sphero, I, I know that they had a really cool piece of engineering in that ball. I don't know how much money they spent to be at CES. It must have been millions of dollars. And I'm like, where did they get this money from? Which, which worked, right? I mean, they ended up sending, selling lots of these little remote control balls. But a lot of that money was from VCs. A lot of that went to marketing and being at these events. And they probably had half their staff. I don't know. I'm guessing on Sphero. So I'm sure I'm going to get tweets from the Sphero people telling me how wrong I am. Yeah, but, right. but does that make sense? It might be 50% of your budget or your time. Yeah, OK. I mean, that number is bigger than I thought. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. That's good, some, something to think about anyway. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. Sure. What's that? Anybody else? All right. Over here, Drew. Oh, oh one more, one, one over here and one over here. Okay. <laughs> 
you put out a couple of good resources for uh, hosting and analytics and uh, how to get started with that. With respect to the previous uh, question, I'm interested in getting uh, someone who can edit videos for anything that I'm doing or uh, do sort of the, the content work. Do you have any resources that are online that's good to find designers, video editors, that kind of thing who can focus on their speciality so I can be on mine? Are you asking for hiring other people, whether that's contract work or full-time? For video editing, as an example, yes. Oh, um, for video editing, yeah, like Upwork, Fiverr, all these places you can find uh, contract labor to do all of this for you. Like any of those contract labor sites. Um, like Upwork, there's one more. Why am I not remembering it right now? But any of those contract labor sites, they will have video editors on there. Or what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to find somebody locally for me, um, like in the New Orleans area to do video editing, because I need them to do work the camera as well. So nothing wrong with hitting your local, local area looking for people who are a freelance editor or like Upwork or one of those. Yep, question? Yeah, they're, they're recording it. Kind of along the same lines, for like startup first project, would you suggest hiring someone specifically to do all of your marketing or just look for people to do freelance work, things like that as required? Depends on your budget and your situation. Um, I mean, if you're going for like venture capitalist funding, then you want to show them that they're getting value for their work. So I would probably start with like 30 to 50% of my budget if I had VC funding towards marketing so that you can start to build that so then when you release, those VCs know that they're getting value. If you're on your own trying to make a bootstrapped hob like hobby into product, um, I, I would start on your, I would, I would do it yourself just to start doing that. Um, or contract labor, because you don't know how much time necessarily, because a lot of that's figuring it out on your own, um, or just hiring somebody like small time, part time to do it. Okay, sure. Um, and then as far as like the freelance sites, how well have those people been like responsive? How are those products? Or would you suggest going for someone locally, things like that? How do you find someone locally? Uh, for me, I'm going through the process of finding a, a videographer locally, and that is Right now, it's going to LinkedIn, saying, I want somebody in this area. Are they videographer, going through their profiles? Oh, they say freelancer. I'm going to reach out to them to see if they want to chat about this. So that's kind of like a, you're playing your own headhunter in that case. Um, so locally is a slightly different game, whereas uh, Upwork and these others, you can actually like post a contract and say, like, oh, I want to target these people with these skills, and it sends it to them, and then they reply back with an estimate, um, and you can choose to go with one of them. Awesome. Let's give Sean a hand. Thanks, Thanks everyone.